Boldwood presents Wedding Bells by the Sunflower Cliffs Written by Georgina Troy And read by Gloria Sanders The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter One Sometimes I just want to grab life by the balls and kick the hell out of it. Izzy Lelivre slammed down her mug, splashing the bank's overdraft rejection letter with cold coffee. And other times? asked her mother, Cherry, not bothering to hide her amusement. She was busily creating another of the huge sculptures which were her source of income. I just grab the nearest toffee crisp and eat it. It's just money, darling. And there are other banks you can approach. Izzy frowned, thinking back to all the paperwork she'd collated for the meeting. I gave them everything they asked for. He laughed at me as if I was some silly woman playing at building up a business. She flicked several drops of liquid from the letter where they'd left a stain. Why didn't he take me seriously? Cherry shook her head, her mop of blonde hair wobbling. Maybe you tripping over your own feet as you entered his office wasn't the sort of entrance he expected from a professional businesswoman. He's still a git. And he was a bit pompous, now I come to think of it. I guess. Make me a tea, darling. Cherry indicated her well-used kettle on the recycled melamine work surface. Raspberry leaf. No, Isabel, this is me you're talking to. You know I only have that in the cupboard for the odd occasion. Make me some proper tea. Izzy walked over to the small cluttered worktop in her mother's studio and put the kettle on. Her mother had been on a diet for as long as Izzy could recall, which was probably why she kept various boxes of teas she'd almost certainly never finish. Izzy made the tea in one of her mother's pottery mugs and carried it over to her, placing it on a small messy table next to her elbow. Studying the sculpture her mother was working on, Izzy narrowed her eyes. It looked like a cross between a man in pain and a yeti. But whatever it was, someone must have commissioned it. Can I open the windows a little wider? Izzy asked fanning herself in the July heat and wishing she didn't have the next ten. This was the third summer she and her best friend, Jessica Moon, had been kept busy building up their vintage hire business, La Pain de Lune. She loved her work, but it would have been nice just to have one weekend dozing lazily in the sunshine in their back garden, instead of creating works of art for the weddings and milestone parties for Jersey locals throughout the summer months. Her mother nodded. Yes, do. She held up a photo, studied it with narrowed eyes, and altered the clay aquiline nose in front of her slightly. Strange-looking man, but rather charismatic in his own way. Who? Izzy asked shrieking as the studio door was flung open and her business partner and best friend, Jess, burst into the room like a manic fairy. She looked furious. What's the matter? Sorry to burst in, Jess panted, pulling a pained expression in Cherry's direction by way of an apology. Cherry waved her over for a peck on the cheek. Jess hurried over, and leaning forward to ensure her lacy crop top didn't connect with Cherry's clay-smeared hands, kissed her. Spotting the letter next to Izzy, she raised her eyebrows. Bank, Izzy nodded. No go, I'm afraid. Bastards. Izzy waited for her to tell them the reason for her unexpected visit, and when Jess picked up and read the bank's letter but remained quiet, she couldn't hold back any longer. Well? Is something the matter? she asked, trying to keep the sarcasm out of her voice. 
Apart from this, you mean? Jess waved the letter in the air. Her shoulders slumped. Yes, something has happened. Go on, Izzy urged when Jess hesitated. You'll never guess what that cow, Catherine de Saint-Croix, has done. She pursed her lips and folded her arms in front of her chest. Izzy could tell by Jess's nervous foot tapping that she wasn't going to like what was coming next. What? she asked, not sure she really wanted to know. They had been asked by Catherine, only daughter of the local seigneur, to hire their entire collection of vintage party decor, including linens, bunting and crockery, for her forthcoming wedding to a wealthy London hedge fund manager. The booking had been for three consecutive weeks, including the stay of various house guests at her father's manor house for the lead-up to the wedding. Dread seeped through Izzy. Please don't tell me she's changed her mind about getting married. No, Jess snapped, hands now perched on her slim hips. Izzy sighed. Thank heavens for that. They've only gone and bloody eloped. Why? Cherry asked, stepping away from her masterpiece, intrigued. No idea. Romantic, though, don't you think? Izzy waved her hands in the air. Uh, hello? Never mind her love life, what about our business? Jess seemed to deflate in front of her. We're screwed. Snot-nosed little madam, I never liked her. Cherry pulled off the pink and green silk scarf she tied around her hair when she was sculpting and threw it to the floor. All three watched it glide down slowly, failing to give Cherry the dramatic effect Izzy suspected her mother had been after. No one treats my daughter like that and gets away with it. Izzy bent down and grabbed the scarf, motioning for her mum to sit down on a nearby clay-splashed stool. Mum, calm down. Izzy didn't like Catherine's fiancé very much, but suspected he wasn't going to have an easy life being married to someone as demanding as she could be. It's our own fault for only having one booking for the three busiest weeks in the year. We should have settled on a few smaller ones. Jess sniffed. I blame myself. Don't, Izzy said, stroking her friend's arm. These things happen. As devastated as Izzy was at this news, she didn't like the thought of Jess feeling so guilty. They'd argued about this booking for days before accepting it. But I insisted it would be a brilliant opportunity, Jess said, her eyes looking rather watery. I thought it would help us, she made air quotes, cultivate a professional relationship with the attendees who would be staying at the manor house. Izzy shook her head. The last thing she was going to do now was be negative and make her friend feel any worse than she already did. Your intentions were good. How much money have you lost? Cherry put down her knife and photo and crossed the stained floor to give Jess a big hug. There must be a cancellation clause in your terms and conditions. Jess began to cry. She didn't sign the contract. What? Izzy stared at her in disbelief. All thought Cherry's arms dropped to her sides. Jessica, please tell me this isn't as bad as I presume. Izzy glared at her mum and hurried over to Jess. She tried to push away the memory of when she had relented about the job and made Jess promise to ensure Catherine would sign their contract. She never signed it, she whispered, just in case she'd misheard. Jess shook her head. But all our clients are supposed to sign the contract before we agree to take them on and mark their date, or in this case, dates, into our diary system. Jess nodded her head rapidly. Yes, I know. 
and ordinarily we'd be covered so that in the event of a last-minute cancellation, her father would still have to pay us a cancellation fee. Yes, with the amount increasing on a sliding scale as each day passed closer to the wedding. She took a deep breath, desperate not to give in to the panic rising in her chest. Jess, I thought you said it was all in hand. Jess sniffed, and pulling a tissue out of her denim shorts pocket gave her nose a good blow. It was. Sort of, she explained. I'd been phoning her every day, and Catherine kept promising to get the contract back to me. This morning, knowing it was getting really close and that you'd have a fit if you knew she still hadn't signed it, I drove to the manor to find her. She groaned, covering her face with her hands. Go on, Cherry urged, going back to sit at her stool. That's when they told me she'd bloody eloped. Oh, Izzy blinked away tears. We did take a deposit, though, didn't we? Jess nodded between gulping sobs. When I confirmed the initial booking. Light-headed with relief that all their hard work hadn't been for nothing, Izzy grinned. Thank heavens for that. She gave her mother a reassuring smile. Cherry's expression remained stern. How much? Jess winced. Ten percent of the total estimate? Is that all? Izzy understood her mother's shock. She was pretty shocked herself and couldn't believe what she was hearing. Only ten percent. She didn't ask in front of her mother why Jess had lowered the deposit from their usual twenty-five percent. It wouldn't make up for having no bookings at the busiest time of the year. Hadn't Cherry nagged them time and time again about needing to toughen up if they wanted La Pain de Lune to survive? She ground me down, Jess said eventually, not looking either of them in the eye. Izzy spotted her mother's tight-lipped irritation, and not being in the mood for one of her tirades, decided to back Jess up. We were hoping to make contacts from Catherine's wealthy family and friends for more weddings and parties, so only asked for a smaller percentage, Izzy explained. It was stupid. It was extremely stupid, Cherry snapped, shaking her head, her blonde curls bouncing wildly around her head. Honestly, girls, you're supposed to be professional event planners. When will you learn? Izzy couldn't help feeling indignant at her mum's words. We did learn, mum, she argued. Don't forget we'd initially intended hiring out our crockery and linen as our business, and now that's just our sideline. We soon learnt we needed to offer more if we wanted La Pain de Lune to work. That's true, Cherry's voice softened slightly. But you can't afford to keep making mistakes and expect to survive financially. This is the first big mistake we've made. It was. Up until now, their business had gone really well. They both loved collecting the vintage decor, and when Jess's granny had died several years before and left her cottage to Jess, they'd both been stunned to discover that she'd left her linens and crockery sets equally between Jess and Izzy. She hated that you didn't have a gran of your own to leave you special mementos. Jess recalled Izzy telling her when the will had been read. She always said we should relish the past when we plan for our future. Although I didn't understand what she was going on about at the time. Izzy had been deeply touched that Jess's gran had thought of her. Apart from Cherry and Jess, of course, the old lady had been there to offer her much support after her boyfriend David's unexpected death four years earlier. She still felt the excitement when they'd discovered the abundance of linens stashed in two cedarwood chests, 
each separated with a layer of tissue paper. The linens had been the inspiration for them to start the business they'd always talked about. Yes, yeah, Cherry said in her typical matter-of-fact way, before turning her attention back to her work. She studied the picture once again. What will you do now? You could advertise for other bookings, I suppose. She dampened her index finger and thumb in a small bowl of water and made a minuscule adjustment to the bust's square chin. I doubt anyone who's anyone would leave their planning until this late in the summer, though. She was right, Izzy thought miserably. What were they supposed to do now? She watched her mother, willing her to come up with an ingenious plan. Cherry kicked a spatula out of her way as she moved around the figure in front of her. Izzy could see she was trying to hide her fury and hoped her mother didn't take it upon herself to go and have words with the seigneur about his daughter. Cherry Le Livre was well known on the island for her no-nonsense attitude to people and this wouldn't be the first time Izzy experienced her marching off and causing chaos at some function or other. I have no idea what to suggest, Cherry said eventually, looking from one to the other of them and shaking her head. It really is too bad of Catherine de Saint-Croix. Just because her father is the seigneur doesn't give her the right to mess about with other people's lives so thoughtlessly. She closed her eyes briefly. Seigneur, what is that anyhow? Izzy wasn't sure. Cherry, who refused to go by her original name of Ingrid, had moved to the island from her native Sweden nearly thirty years before. She'd told Izzy many times how much she'd hated working as a waitress for one of the local hotels. Despite her own parents being socially important in her hometown, she still found the whole idea of anyone thinking they were higher up the social chain than others, extremely nauseating. Not that the seigneur probably saw himself this way, Izzy thought. Catherine certainly did, though. Izzy loved her mother. Since her father had died when Izzy was ten, she was her only parent. But her fierceness when protecting Izzy and her older half-brother Alex was legendary. If only she'd given us more notice, Jess said, her voice tight. A week doesn't give us any time to salvage this mess. I know, Izzy agreed, stroking. She would have hated to be poor Jess. We'll think of something. Don't worry, she soothed. She heard whistling as someone came down the lavender-lined pathway towards the studio. It stopped as Alex entered the large sunny room and saw her. Hey, munchkin, what are you doing skulking in here with herself? Don't be rude, Cherry said, flicking a piece of wet clay at her beloved son. Can't you see the girls are upset? He seemed to notice Jess for the first time. What's up? he asked looking awkward and moving over to the sink on the other side of the studio to them. Izzy wasn't ready for a post-mortem about the unexpected cancellation. It was Izzy's cue to leave. A bit of a business disaster, she said, leading Jess towards the door. I'll leave Mum to explain everything. We need to get on. But I might be able to help, he said, concern on his tanned face. Jess's step faltered, and Izzy had to pull her gently along. She was aware of Jess's attraction to her brother, but as much as Izzy loved Alex, she wasn't sure Jess could cope with someone whose life was ruled by the tides, especially a professional surfer who garnered as much female attention as he did. Thanks, but we're in a rush, she fibbed. Bye, you two she said, giving her mum a quick peck on a mucky cheek and nodding in Alex's direction. Mum can tell you all about it. She propelled Jess outside. We've got work to do. 
she could hear Cherry launching into a tirade about the de Saint-Croix family and left them to pick over the bones of their disaster. What are we going to do now? Jess asked, sniffing miserably as they walked to the back door. I have absolutely no idea, Izzy replied. But I do know we're not giving up this business without a fight, and certainly not because Catherine's let us down. As they walked up the garden path, Alex bellowed for them to stop. Izzy groaned. She wasn't in the mood for his usual teasing and motioned for Jess to go back to their place. You make us a couple of drinks. I'll catch up with you in a sec. Hey, I was calling you, Alex said, running up the path towards her, his sun-bleached floppy blonde hair falling over one eye. I heard. He pushed his hair out of his eye and gave her a hug. I'm sure it's not as bad as you think, is? She shrugged him off. I hope not. Alex gave her his brightest smile. If you don't want me to try and help, how about filling some of your time this weekend by helping me celebrate my birthday? Bugger, I'd forgotten. He laughed. That's fine, little sis, he said, ruffling her hair and making her scowl at him. Get off, idiot. Agree to come to my party, then? Why? He never usually asked her to join him at parties. It's a party, is. You might enjoy yourself. Party, Jess said, appearing next to Alex, blowing her nose and looking a little less forlorn. Izzy pulled a face at her friend. She guessed she wouldn't have gone too far. Yeah, it's tomorrow night at the dive, he said, smiling at her appreciatively. Jess dabbed at her damp eyes with a corner of her tissue. Izzy could tell she was perfectly aware she was showing her enviably long legs off to perfection in her tiny denim shorts. She sighed, causing Alex to grin knowingly at her. It'll do you both good to have a bit of fun for a change, he said, winking at Izzy and trying his best to be persuasive. She barely contained a groan. Watching her brother and Jess was almost like seeing two peacocks showing off. We've got so much to do, though, Alex, Izzy argued. You're always working too hard. Unlike him, she thought. Great. I suppose all the people you've invited will be surfers and beach bums, Izzy teased, beginning to warm to the idea. He laughed. Of course. Who knows, you might surprise yourself and like one of them. Or even, he widened his eyes in mock shock. Have fun. Jess giggled. I think we should go, Is. We can have a few drinks, a bit of a dance, and forget about this bloody mess for a bit. Izzy thought for a moment. What else would they realistically be doing on a Saturday night? All they could do was phone around their contacts, update their website, and put the word out on social networking sites that they were now available for last-minute bookings. It was all so humiliating, and not the sort of image they were hoping to project. So much for the well-organised business persona they were hoping to build locally. I suppose we don't need more than a few hours to get everything in place, she admitted. Jess was right. It would do them good. Later that afternoon, the two girls were repacking the linen for Catherine's wedding into boxes in the tiny living room of their Rosal Bay cottage. They worked quietly, each lost in their own thoughts, till Izzy felt compelled to check yet again if anyone had contacted them about a booking. She stood up and stretched, glancing outside. Their lawn was awash with daisies and buttercups. We really need to mow soon, you know, she said, reaching for the laptop and opening up their website. Never mind the garden, Jess said nervously. Anything online? Izzy shook her head. Nothing. Jess sighed. It's all my stupid fault. I should have listened to you. 
she placed the lid over the last box and carried it over to the table at the far side of the room. I'm sick of being miserable, she said, a hint of the Jess Izzy knew seeping back. Let's go for a walk along the harbour wall and treat ourselves to a chocolate mountain. Izzy smiled, even though it really was too warm to enjoy a hot chocolate. Oh, yes, she said, relishing the elaborate drink, desperate to keep the positive vibe going. Jess pushed a tenner into her back pocket and they headed outside. She leant against the low garden wall, which boasted orma shells along the top. Grazing her hand lightly across them while Jess locked the door, she turned her face up to the early evening sunshine. She couldn't imagine ever tiring of living in this pretty island. Bloody Catherine, eloping like that, Jess said almost to herself. I know it was stupid not to get her to sign, but there's no point in us wallowing. Exactly. Izzy agreed, linking arms with Jess, as they turned and walked along the narrow road towards the pier, the sun warming their bare arms. We knew we'd have to take a few chances, and sometimes they don't pan out. This was one of those times. I suppose it was, Jess said, smiling for the first time that day. The wide granite pier was busy with others making the most of the summer weather. Izzy loved this place, with its pretty little houses and huts on the left and the tiny sea-shaped bay to their right. She looked down onto the tourist-packed sandy beach. I love living here, she said, recalling when Jess had asked her to consider moving into the cottage soon after her grandmother had passed away. Izzy hadn't even taken the time to before saying a hearty yes. Looking back, Jess had always been so supportive of her when she'd lost David. Her friend had never felt sorry for herself because her own mother had died giving birth to her. Jess had always insisted she loved her gran like a mother anyway. But Izzy suspected Jess's toughness came from her putting on a brave face about not ever knowing her real mother. Izzy realised it all could have gone horribly wrong, ruining the friendship they had enjoyed since primary school. But everything had worked out nicely in the cottage that was so different from her mother's cool, simplistic tastes. It even had a mysterious room they'd discovered shortly after she'd moved in. Izzy had been outside and noticed a window at the top of the building. When they'd tried to discover how to get to it, they'd unearthed a locked door behind a wardrobe in her bedroom. But despite searching everywhere, still hadn't discovered where Jess's gran had hidden the key. And Jess was loath to damage the house by breaking down the door. Despite the lack of parking, Jess asked, Parking was a nightmare through the summer when they needed to bring their small van to the cottage and load it up for parties. Even that is worth coping with to live here. She breathed in the warm, salty air. How many other people can say they have a slip onto a beach at the end of their road? We'll find a way round this, you know, Jess. I hope so, Jess squinted out to see. I feel so guilty about this mess. Don't, Izzy smiled. It'll be okay. But what if it isn't? Izzy stopped walking and grabbed Jess's arm. The only people we have to prove ourselves to are ourselves, Jess. So what if this doesn't work out, she said. I believe we'll only fail if we don't try, and we are trying, so no more negativity. Let's enjoy this gorgeous evening and make the most of going to a party. She laughed and pulled Jess on towards the hut once again. Let's face it, we're never free on a Saturday night. Jess nodded. You're right, we don't get to do this very often. 
They reached the red-painted snack hut and ordered their jumbo hot chocolates. We're going to be enormous if we keep on having cancellations, Jess laughed. They leant over the metal railings while they waited for their order, looking down on the groups of families and teenagers sharing picnics, making the most of the summer. Or we could start walking along the cliff paths when the weather cools, like we said we'd do last winter. Jess nudged Izzy to let her know their drinks were ready. Thanking the cafe server, they carried their cardboard cups further along the pier. We should do that, you know. We're always moaning about needing to do more exercise, and there are some gorgeous walks around the island. Izzy pictured the cliff path on the north of the island she'd walked several months before with her mum. One of the people I was talking to at a party mentioned a good book of paths. Izzy pulled the chocolate flake from her drink and bit into it, moaning happily. I think it's a good idea. I'd rather burn off calories walking. These drinks are far too delicious to give up. They sat on a bench, lost in their own thoughts. Izzy looked across the beach to the hill, with its pretty houses dotted all the way up, partially hidden by pine trees and the narrow road wending its way towards the rest of the island. There really was no place like home. She'd enjoyed travelling to India and the Far East with David during a nine-month getaway, when they'd both worked as English language teachers, and there was her original ambition to be a horse trainer. But his death, weeks before she was about to go away to study, had crushed her ability to focus on anything much. After giving in to Jess's coaxing to join her with the venture they'd chatted about over the years, and with her friends constant urging her to meet prospective clients and keeping her busy, Izzy had come out of herself. They'd worked hard building up Le Pain de Lune, and eventually she'd stopped cursing fate for stepping in and guiding her on a different future to the one she'd expected. We're pretty lucky, Jess, she said, taking a tentative sip of her hot drink. I know things are a bit lousy at the moment, but we've got a lovely place to live in, and we will find a way to claw back some money, I'm sure of it. Jess shrugged. We'll give it a go, and we can always go to Plan B if we don't find a solution. Intrigued, Izzy raised her eyebrows. And that is? Jess laughed. I haven't figured it out yet, but I will. Chapter Two The club was packed, but it wasn't hard to locate Tanned, and even the less attractive of his friends seemed to have some appealing quality about them. Jess elbowed Izzy sharply in the ribs. Ouch! What? she said, wincing. Look, who's he? She gestured towards a tall, dark-haired man who had olive skin and slate-black hair and was laughing with her brother. He looked like a 1920s silent movie star. They were talking to a taller man with fairer hair, but there was something strikingly similar about the two strangers. They look like brothers, she said to Izzy. Mm, I don't recognise either of them. Izzy did. I've seen him at the manor where Catherine lives, she said, indicating the fair-haired man. I think he works in the gardens or stables or something. She didn't mention she'd spotted him galloping across one of the fields a few weeks before as she was dropping off a wedding plan to Catherine. She'd nearly had palpitations at the sight. It was like something out of a period movie, very Darcy-esque. She sighed at the memory. Poor sod, working for that cow. Gorgeous, though, Jess said, flicking her long, dark hair. Mind you, he's not as pretty as your brother. A bit too rough and ready for my liking. Please don't go there, Jess. Alex is fine as a brother, but he makes a horrible boyfriend. I don't think he understands the concept of one man for one woman. Izzy had known about her best friend's crush on Alex for years. 
She'd even teased her on the odd occasion, but secretly hoped they didn't ever get together. Someone would end up getting their heart broken and she'd be stuck right in the middle. Come on, Jess said, grabbing her by the elbow. Let's go and introduce ourselves. By the time they reached the table, the dark-haired man had gone. Izzy stifled a sigh. She spotted Alex waving at them and pushed their way through the crowd to get to his table. He stood up to greet them. Hey, shorty, you came. She refrained from telling him where to go. She wasn't short at all. In fact, growing up, she'd been teased about her long, skinny legs and height, although thankfully her friends had pretty much caught up with her by the time she was 18, but his teasing never ceased. I keep hoping you'll get bored of making fun of me, she said, as he grabbed her wrist and pulled her towards him. Never. I enjoy it far too much. He grabbed her cheek between his index finger and thumb and squeezed it. Little jiggy jobs. She forced a smile on her face since the fair-haired guy had just appeared from the bar. Meet Ed. He's an old schoolmate, he said. He's been telling me all about a trip he's going on with a group of friends. Are you going too? Jess asked. Too busy, unfortunately. He smiled at Jess and motioned for her to sit next to him. Poor Jess, Izzy thought, aware her friend was going to take this attention a little too much to heart. Izzy said hello to Ed and sat down next to him. He narrowed his eyes slightly. Haven't I seen you at the manor? Izzy nodded. Not wishing to think about Catherine and their awful dilemma, she forced a smile. It wasn't difficult to pay attention, as he was incredibly handsome. So, tell me about your trip, then. Alex disappeared over to the bar, leaving Jess and Izzy to listen to Ed. He was very well spoken, which wasn't surprising if he'd attended the most expensive school on the island, as Alex had done. Ten of us are picking up a yacht at Le Vieux Port in Marseille and sailing down to Nice over the next three weeks. Sounds amazing, Izzy said truthfully. Have you done this sort of thing before? He shook his head. No, but a close friend delivers yachts to people as part of his job. He's delivering this one for a friend of his, and the friend suggested he take some people along for the ride. I wish I could do something like that, Jess said, looking across the room at Alex leaning over the bar as he gave his order to the attentive barmaid. She crossed her long, bare legs when he turned to look in their direction. Has Alex told you about our disaster? Izzy glared at Jess, not wishing to insult Ed's boss's daughter at a party. Ah, Catherine's elopement. Yes, I heard about that, he said, looking slightly awkward. How did it affect you two? Izzy explained about their event planning and hiring business, and their stupidity at not making Catherine sign their contract. So, you see, we're a bit stuffed at the moment work-wise, and this is supposed to be our busiest time of the year. I'm sorry you've been left in such a difficult position. Catherine can be very thoughtless at times. That was an understatement, Izzy said to herself, but nodded. He stared at them both silently for a bit. She wasn't sure how to break the awkward silence, so asked, When do you go? Go? He laughed. We thought it would be a perfect way to celebrate. Any excuse. Alex arrived back at the table carrying a tray of drinks. I thought it would save us going back too soon for refills. Typical Alex, always ready to save any time he could, Izzy thought. Cheers, she said, taking a vodka and tonic. Jess gave him a wide smile that went on for rather a long time, Izzy thought, though he didn't appear to mind. I met your father recently with Alex, Ed said. He's a fun guy. He's not my dad, only Alex's. Ed looked mortified. Hell, I'm sorry. I never think before opening my mouth. 
She didn't believe that for a second. Wishing to put him at his ease, she placed a hand on his forearm. It was impossible to miss the hard muscles under his blue shirt. Working outside had a lot to answer for, it seemed. It's fine. Alex's dad was Mum's husband, and mine was a boyfriend she met when he was away on business. She smiled to soften her words. I'm surprised you don't know that bit of scandal. It's still very much on the locals' lips. He shook his head. Must have been before I came over here. I'd have loved my dad to be a flash businessman like yours, Jess said to Alex, her head tilted to one side. This was getting a little worrying. Jess, Izzy said, widening her eyes for emphasis. Can I have a quick chat in the ladies? What? Oh, all right then, she said, getting up. We won't be a sec. Izzy ignored Alex's amusement as they left the table and grabbed hold of Jess's arm, pulling her into the ladies' room. What are you doing? Nothing. She looked so angelic that if Izzy didn't know her quite so well, she'd believe her. I know my brother is only three years older than you, but he has so much more experience than you do. And I just know that he'd end up hurting you. I'd hate for that to happen. I'd be fine, Jess said dreamily. But don't you think you'll be a bit out of your depth with him? Don't get mad, she laughed and pushed Izzy's left shoulder. He's great fun. Well, Izzy started. I'm a big girl, Iz, Jess interrupted. You don't have to look out for me anymore. All that business with Sean was a big fuss over nothing. It hadn't seemed like it at the time, Izzy recalled anxiously, or for about a year after Jess's first love had uns two years before. Izzy sighed. I'm just worried about you, she explained, disliking the tug of guilt as she tried to persuade Jess that Alex wasn't someone she should bother with. Alex might say all the right things, Jess, but he's no Prince Charming. It wasn't like Jess had ever taken her advice over anything anyway, so she freshened up, reapplied her pink lip gloss, and they returned to the table where several others now congregated. Don't you think, Iz? Alex shouted, waving them over. I was telling Ed about Mum's latest creation in her studio. I thought it looks like an ugly bear. Izzy laughed. He's right, but someone will be paying a small fortune to own it. We'll never make a fortune now, small or otherwise, Jess pouted. Bloody Catherine, eloping like she did. Izzy noticed Ed tense and glared at Jess. Didn't she realise how awkward this must be for him? Although aware he and Catherine probably got along, it was hard to imagine someone as snobby as her spending time with a bloke who worked at the manor. Then again, Izzy thought, taking in his handsome face and broad shoulders, you would have to be a nun not to appreciate Ed's physical attributes. Ed downed the remnants of his pint. Why don't you two come with us on the yacht? Izzy frowned. Sorry? You said you had nothing on for the next few weeks, so why not come with us? Jess squealed and beamed up at him. We'd love to! Horrified by Jess's sudden acceptance, Izzy asked, But how much will it cost? She ignored Jess's loud groan. Someone had to think about money. Hadn't they only this afternoon been fretting about their lack of it? Um, not much, he said. We don't have to pay to charter the yacht, so it'll be your contribution towards food and fuel. Oh, and your travel costs to Marseille. We'd go via Paris, where you can meet the others at my parents' house nearby. He gave them both a smile. Yes? Jess and Izzy exchanged glances. When he put it like that, it did seem doable. She contemplated his words for a few more seconds. 
she had a small balance in her current account, and it wasn't as if they had anything else to do in Jersey at the moment. She could see Jess studying her face. Without speaking, but his lips drew back into a wide smile. Two of the people coming are here tonight. I'll fetch them for you, so you can meet before we go. He left them and walked into the crowd. Jess squealed. Oh my God, I can't believe what we've just agreed to do. Neither could Izzy. She looked across the room at Ed, who stopped in front of two guys who were being chatted up by a group of girls. One of them was the dark-haired man they'd seen talking to Alex earlier. Are you two nuts? Alex snapped. Alex rarely shouted at her, and never at Jess, so they both stared at him in shock at his outburst. What's the matter? Izzy asked, noticing Jess's crumbling expression. Alex leant closer to them. You don't know these guys. He narrowed his eyes. Why would you agree to go on a cruise with them and their friends? But you said you went to school with Ed, Izzy snapped, furious with him for stating the obvious and making her consider something she'd rather not. Are you saying Ed is someone we should steer clear of? Alex sighed heavily. No, he's a great guy, but you don't know the others, do you? She shook her head miserably. No. Look, shouted Jess. Here they come. The three of them sat silently watching Ed lead two friends over to their table, one dark, one blonde. They were smiling and seemed friendly enough to Izzy. Izzy? Jess, Alex, Ed said. This is Roman and Xavier. Jess put her hand out for them to shake, but was pulled off her stool by the darker-haired Roman and kissed three times on her cheek. Ooh, bonjour, she said, realising he was French. Izzy stepped down when Xavier took her by the shoulders and did the same. Ed, he tells us you are willing to sail with us to the Côte d'Azur next week. Izzy nodded. Yes, if that's okay with you both. Mais oui, c'est un plaisir. He looked at Ed. You have to explain to the girls the details? Non, he said, immediately rattling off a string of sentences Izzy couldn't decipher, despite having studied French at school. Realising what he'd done, Ed looked at them. Pardon, I'm being rude. He took the party invitation from his pocket and Xavier passed him a pen. I'll write down our phone numbers and the address where we'll be staying before travelling to Marseille. I have an email address too, so please email me tomorrow and I'll forward all the details. Izzy took the invitation from him and read it. If you decide, I don't want you to feel pressured to go. He smiled at each girl. Please let me know if you do change your minds, though. She noticed Alex glaring at Ed and his friends with irritation. Izzy stood next to her brother. I think we need to all have a bit of a chat, don't you? Alex said quietly, bending his head down to her level. Izzy nodded. The last thing she wanted was her brother kicking off and embarrassing her. And after all, he did have her best interests at heart. Her mood towards him softened. She moved to sit next to him to allow the others space in the banquette around the table and gave Alex a nudge. I'll be fine, I promise, she whispered in his ear. He put his arm around her and Jess and smiled at her friend. He cleared his throat. Ed, I know you well and you're a good mate. Alex began, staring from one to the other of the three guys sitting around the table. Zav and Roman, I've only met you this evening, but I want you all to know that Izzy is my little sister, and Jess is like my little sister. Jess gave a pained whimper. Izzy concentrated on not looking at her, but at the reactions of the three men. I expect you to treat these two as if they were also your little sisters. He gave each one a pointed glare. Any funny business, and I don't care where you happen to be, I'll come and make your lives a living hell. Xavier swallowed and Roman nodded rapidly several times. 
Ed smiled. Understood. Good. That's settled then, Alex said. He peered down at Jess and then at Izzy. You two make your arrangements, but if you change your mind at any time, you contact me and I'll bring you back, okay? The girls nodded. Izzy could see Jess was still devastated by Alex referring to her as his sister. You wish to dance? Xavier said to Izzy. She instinctively glanced at Ed, though she wasn't sure why. Maybe it was because, as handsome as the Frenchman was, she couldn't help feeling drawn to Ed. He gave her a hint of a smile. Yes, OK, she said, taking Xavier's hand and being led onto the dance floor. Jess and Romain followed closely behind them and danced to no church in the wild. You have been to France before? Xavier shouted over the music. The girls nodded. Yes, many times, but not to the south of France, Izzy said. Nor on a yacht, Jess added. I am certain you will like the two other guys who are joining us and the other three girls. We know most of them since we were children. Roman laughed when Jess got carried away, as she often did on the dance floor, and twirled around him, giggling. They will love you girls, you are so, um, how you say? Fun? Jess offered, waving her arms in the air. Exactly, you are fun. He laughed and copied her. Izzy smiled at Xavier, who shook his head in mock horror. Roman is always like this when he has consumed one or two drinks. Izzy nodded in Jess's direction. They'll get along well, then. He leant closer and in a loud whisper said, Do not worry. I know we are strangers to you now, but we are good people. I am sure you will feel happier when you meet our mother and father at our home where everyone will stay before leaving full of vieux port in Marseille. Izzy made a mental note to relay this snippet of information to Alex. He would be much happier knowing that. I look forward to meeting them, she said honestly. Chapter 3 Izzy leant over the back of the ferry, feeling more seasick than she could have ever imagined, and wondered what the hell she'd been thinking agreeing to spend almost three weeks on a boat. She said as much to Jess. It's two and a bit, Jess said from behind her. Remember, we're staying a couple of nights at the guy's parents' place, though what we're going to do there I can't imagine. How will they fit ten extra people into their home? Izzy didn't care right now. She simply wanted the boat to dock in San Malo so she could get off and stop feeling so nauseated. Three quarters of an hour later, they carried their rucksacks off the metal gangplank and made the fifteen-minute trek to the train station. The French road signs didn't look much different to those at home. Then again, they were only one hour.